All right, so in this lecture, we're gonna be talking chlamydia and gonorrhea. Now, chlamydia and gonorrhea are the most common STDs that you're gonna be diagnosing. So it's important to know who it affects, how to screen, how to diagnose, and how to treat. Now, very important, we know that chlamydia and gonorrhea, for the most part, are going to cause problems for the woman, not so much the man. Now, the reason why we're screening for males is because we don't want transmission to females. And the problems or the complications that can happen with the female include infertility, PID, which is pelvic inflammatory disease. They can have chronic pain. They can have pregnancy complications like ectopic, spontaneous abortion, and premature rupture of membranes. So really, the main reason to screen males and to treat is really to prevent transmission to the female. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when a mother has chlamydia, has gonorrhea, they become pregnant, and you have a child born vaginally in an untreated mother, this can also present with complications to the baby. Now, <clears throat> things that can happen, we can have pneumonia, we can have conjunctivitis, we can have pharyngitis, and we can have gonococcemia. Now, risk factors for chlamydia, risk factors for gonorrhea are gonna be multiple sex partners, recent new sex partner within the last 60 days, not using condoms, prior STDs, and um, having a history of drug use. Now, the way we screen, we're going to screen every single year annually. We're gonna screen women who are under the age of 25 universally. This means every woman under 25 gets screened every single year. After 25, we only screen if we have one of the above or one of the previous risk factors. If we don't, then we really don't screen. Males are the same way because the reason to screen males is to prevent transmission. We only screen males if they have risk factors. If there are no risk factors, then we don't screen. So now let's get into a little bit more detail. Let's get into the specifics of chlamydia and gonorrhea. All right, now get, let's get into the symptoms of chlamydia and gonorrhea. Now, the problem with symptoms here is that the majority of males, the majority of females are going to be asymptomatic. The majority will not present with discharge. The majority will not present with urethritis. The majority will be diagnosed on routine screening and or because of the history that they say about, you know, I have a new sex partner, unprotected intercourse, multiple sex partners. Remember, risk factors are key here and we wanna screen those patients who have risk factors. Now, in females, the cervix is the most common site that's affected, and 85% of these patients are going to be asymptomatic. When we do have symptoms, we're gonna look for discharge, we're gonna look for irregular bleeding, dyspareunia, postcoital bleeding, meaning we have bleeding after intercourse, and we can even have signs of urethritis. So all of the primary infection will be on the cervix. There are times, or a small percentage of times, the bacteria can actually make its way into the urethra and give urethritis, and this will give signs similar to that of a UTI, so we can have dysuria and increased urinary frequency. Now, if you do a dipstick, the dipstick might be able to help you differentiate this. However, a lot of this is going to be based on risk factors, so you wanna test these patients. But if you do a dipstick, you do a urine analysis, you're gonna notice pyuria, but you're not gonna see bacteria on the dipstick and the urine analysis. So if you see pyuria without bacteria, this should point to chlamydia and or gonorrhea. In males, it's the same. Males, for the most part, are going to be asymptomatic, but when they do present with symptoms, we're gonna be looking for discharge. Now, the discharge with chlamydia is going to be watery and mucoid, and gonorrhea is, for the most part, going to present with mucoid purulence. So it's gonna be a lot more copious when we have gonorrhea. The problem is, in real life, in clinical practice, they often present identical, and it's impossible for you to distinguish this based on clinical grounds. You have to do testing in order to properly diagnose. Now, in women, cervicitis is considered to be uncomplicated infection. We treat, no problem. The problem begins once we start to ascend into the upper genital tract. So anything below the cervix is considered lower genital tract. Anything above the cervix is considered upper genital tract. And once we hit the upper genital tract, this is when we have PID. 
This is when we start to have pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, pelvic inflammatory disease will have all of the symptoms that we discussed with cervicitis, but we're also going to start to have pelvic pain. And pelvic pain is really going to be the main symptom of PID. We can also have adenexal tenderness, cervical motion tenderness, and fever as well. Now, the fever really depends on the severity of the disease. The more severe, the more likely we are to have fever. Lastly, we can have something called perihepatitis, and this is also called Fitzhugh-Curtis syndrome. What happens is we have inflammation of the liver capsule secondary to chlamydia infection, and patients are also often gonna present with right upper quadrant pain. So Fitzhugh-Curtis uh, Fitzhugh syndrome is something to look out for as well. And especially in males, we can have a 1% actually develop reactive arthritis. So we have arthralgias, we have arthritis, secondary to STD, chlamydia, gonorrhea. So 1% of males will develop reactive arthritis. Something else to look out for in the male population is going to be epididymitis. Epididymitis in patients who are less than 35 will most commonly be due to chlamydia and gonorrhea. Patients present with unilateral testicular pain, swelling, and we can even notice a hydrocele. We can diagnose this on ultrasound, but for the most part, this is going to be diagnosed clinically. Now, lastly, one last point about symptoms. Chlamydia and gonorrhea can also present outside of the vaginal canal, and it can present outside of the penis as well. Patients can even present with pharyngitis and conjunctivitis. So we can have chlamydial infection of the throat and we can have chlamydia gonorrhea infection of the eyes. Now, it's not really all that known how common this is in, with pharyngitis and conjunctivitis, but it's important to note that it's a possible cause as well. We're gonna diagnose this with nucleic acid amplification test. This is the gold standard. Nucleic acid amplification test can either be done with a swab or with the urine, both are good. Now, the gold standard in women is to do a self-administered swab. So we give the patient the swab, they go to the restroom, they take a sample from the vaginal canal, and we send that out for culture for nucleic acid amplification tests. In men, we don't wanna use a swab. In men, we get urine and we send that and do nucleic acid amplification tests. Now, when we collect the urine, we wanna make sure it's the first catch and we wanna make sure that the patient is not cleaning before using the restroom. So this is a little bit different than when comparing that to a UTI. No cleaning, first catch urine, send that out. And this is how we're gonna diagnose, nucleic acid amplification test. Now, let's get into the treatment of chlamydia and gonorrhea. All right, so now let's get into the treatment for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Now, two things we have to keep in mind. For chlamydia, it's very rare to have resistance against antibiotics. For gonorrhea, it's very, or it's, it's more common, I should say, to have resistance against antibiotics. So for chlamydia, we're really gonna have two first-line options here. We're gonna have azithromycin and doxycycline. Azithromycin is very easy. It's going to be one gram, one dose, and that's it. So azithromycin comes at 500 milligrams. We give two pills, we take it at the same time, and that's the treatment. The alternative first line therapy is gonna be doxycycline. Doxycycline, we're gonna give 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. Now, theoretically, doxy is a little bit more efficacious than azithromycin, but it's negligible. The problem with doxycycline is the twice a day dosing and the seven day regimen. A lot of patients don't comply to this regimen and they forget and they stop early. This is why azithromycin is more practical to give to the patient because they take two pills and they're done. The problem with azithromycin is it can cause upset stomach, nausea, and even vomiting. Now, alternatives are going to be levofloxacin and ofloxacin. Levofloxacin is 500 milligrams once a day for seven days. Ofloxacin is 300 twice a day for seven days. Now, the good thing about levofloxacin is if you have a patient who comes in and they're presenting with simple dysuria, or dysuria and frequency, and you're not quite sure if this is chlamydia or if this is a UTI, you can give levofloxacin. It's got a great cure rate, and you can target both the UTI and you can target chlamydia at the same time with one antibiotic. 
Now, this is considered second line. Obviously, first line is azithromycin. In pregnant patients, we're going to choose azithromycin because doxycycline is contraindicated in pregnancy. So we only have one option here in, in uh, pregnancy and it's going to be azithromycin. Now, for whatever reason, because patients who are pregnant are already predisposed to nausea, they're already predisposed to vomiting, and some patients can't tolerate the one gram of azithromycin and they vomit the medication. If this is the case, then the alternative here is going to be amoxicillin, 500 milligrams, three times a day for seven days. Now, it's nowhere near as good as azithro, but if for whatever reason they can't take azithro, then this is an acceptable alternative, and this is what we're going to do in the pregnant patient only. Gonorrhea, gonorrhea only has one first line agent, ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams, nothing else. Cefixime is no longer first line, fluoroquinolones are not first line. Ceftriaxone, 250, one shot, one IM dose, and that's it. Whenever we're diagnosing gonorrhea, isolated gonorrhea, we're also going to want to treat for chlamydia. Now, there's the rationale be between this or behind this. When we give ceftriaxone 250 milligrams, there's, going to, there's actually starting to be increased resistance. So we're going to add azithromycin and or, or we add doxycycline. So ceftriaxone plus azithro or ceftriaxone plus doxy. Now the azithromycin also has activity against gonorrhea. So by adding azithromycin to ceftriaxone, we increase the probability that the patient is cured and we can also treat occult chlamydia because oftentimes when we have gonorrhea, over 50% of the time we're also going to have chlamydia. So ceftriaxone also give azithro or doxycycline. If for whatever reason ceftriaxone is not available, then the alternative here is going to be suffixing. It's the only oral agent that, be, that can be given um, as far as a third generation cephalosporin that's going to, as far as a cephalosporin, I'm sorry, to treat gonorrhea. If a patient is allergic to penicillin, they have anaphylaxis, they have a severe allergy, then we don't wanna give cephalosporins because although there's a small percent of cross-reactivity, it's negligible, it's one to 2%, there's still a small risk of severe anaphylaxis. So penicillin allergy that's severe, we avoid, avoid cefixime, we avoid ceftriaxone, and instead what we're going to do is we're going to give azithromycin. Now, the difference between this dose and the dose for chlamydia is that we're going to double it. So we're going to give azithromycin two grams. If you remember, I said that patients who get azithromycin one gram have nausea, have vomiting. Azithromycin, giving at a dose of two grams, actually has a 99% cure rate for gonorrhea. So technically, we can treat both chlamydia and gonorrhea with azithromycin two grams. The problem is, it's very heavy on the stomach and the majority of your patients will not be able to tolerate it. This is why you only give azithromycin two grams if you can't give ceftriaxone and you can't give cefixime. When you give azithromycin, although it's 99% cure rate and you technically can give it as monotherapy, it's often recommended that we combine it with a second antibiotic like gemifloxacin or gentamicin. So azithro two grams plus gemifloxacin or you're going to add gentamicin to that. Like we said, there's hardly any resistance to chlamydia, but we're noticing increasing resistance to gonorrhea, even with ceftriaxone. Now, after treatment, we have two options. We have test of cure and we have retesting. Test of cure means we're testing to see if the primary infection that we just treated went away. If the patient was given a medication for chlamydia first line, they don't need a test of cure. If they continue to have symptoms, it's more than likely a different infection. It's more than likely they were reinfected because they had intercourse with their partner too soon, their partner wasn't treated, or they didn't take the medication as indicated. So if you're going to test for cure, we have to wait three weeks. The reason being is if you have the patient come before the three weeks, they're going to have a false positive. So wait the three weeks and do a test of cure. The only indication for test of cure is if you use a second line antibiotic, 
they continue to have symptoms, or the patient is pregnant. Everybody else, there's no need to do a test of cure. The difference is with a, a retest. Everybody needs to get retested. Regardless if you gave first line or second line, in three months, you have your patient come back and you retest. This is very important that you test for cure with anybody who was giving a second line antibiotic. Now, if you were treating gonorrhea, they continue to have symptoms, we more than likely have a resistant strain of gonorrhea. At this point, it's advisable that we send the urine for culture and we wanna culture the gonorrhea and we wanna have sensitivities. This way it's going to tell us which antibiotic is going to be best for this strain of gonorrhea. So that's uh, treatment. This is chlamydia gonorrhea. This is everything you need to know. If there are any questions whatsoever, send an email to physicianassistantboards.com. More than happy to answer any questions and I'll see you on the next lecture. Take care.